August 14th, notes on experiment designated X. Experimental subject, myself, James Xavier. X, the most fantastic experiment you have ever taken part in, presents Ray Moland in his most challenging role since his Academy Award winning Lost Weekend. X, the man with the X-ray eyes. Are you all right? It's like a splitting of the world. More light than I've ever seen. Filled with light. X, the man with the X-ray eyes, tries to help the most desperate in our society and enjoys all the delights of secretly studying sexology. A doctor with the power to see what others cannot believe. He can overcome the unknown, save lives, and invade the glamour gambling casinos of Las Vegas and defy the goddess of chance. Don't draw. Don't draw. Next card's a face card. X, the man with the X-ray eyes. That's the movie trailer from the 1963 science fiction film X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes, directed by Roger Corman. Back then, it won a Silver Globe Award at the International Science Fiction Film Festival. But that was 1963, when everyone knew X-ray vision without machines was science fiction. But if you go back only 30 years, people believed a man truly could have X-ray eyes and that man's name was Kuda Bucks. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. X, the man with the X-ray eyes. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… All families have their ups and downs. However, when you find a clan where an infanticide trial is arguably the least worst thing to happen to them, it's safe to say you have found one very special household. A woman moves into a home where the past three residents went insane. What could possibly go wrong? Bartholomew Roberts, better known as the infamous pirate Black Bart, operated in the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean from 1719 to 1722. He was easily the most successful pirate of the Golden Age of Piracy having been known to have captured over 400 ships in his day. But could it be true that he was actually forced to become a pirate against his will? But first, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Invisibility? Flight? Super strength or speed? What about X-ray vision like Superman? Would you believe there was a man in the 20th century who did have X-ray vision without technology to do it? He had a few other superpowers as well. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. If you were a kid reading comic books in the mid-20th century, Chances are you saw ads in every issue selling X-ray vision glasses. If they worked, you could have been like Kuda Bucks, known as the man with the X-ray eyes. Bucks, a Pakistani magician born as Kuda Buksh in 1905, mystified many with his ability to seemingly have eyeless sight in the mid-1930s. 
He also walked on hot coals, allowed himself to be buried alive for up to three hours, and could stop his heart and pulse on command. But it was his X-ray vision that was of special interest to many who'd been studying such possibilities at the time, including French writer Jules Romains. Psychic researcher Harry Price described Romain's beliefs in his book Confessions of a Ghost Hunter. As somnambulistic subjects can apparently guide themselves with remarkable ease with their eyes closed or even bandaged, they may acquire a prodigious delicacy of sensation and know how to make us of a thousand signs which a man in a waking state passes by without notice. Their hearing, touch, and smell undergo hyperesthetic change and manage sometimes to take the place of sight. Bucks demonstrated his talents by blindfolding himself with surgical bandages, tape, cotton wool, a mask, and dough covering his eye sockets. His face was completely covered except for his nose. He then proceeded to read anything put in front of him. The man with the X-ray eyes even demonstrated his skills by riding a bicycle through the busy streets of London with his blindfolding method in place. In 1935, he performed several tests for Price and other researchers at the University of London Council for Physical Investigation. Price was allowed to select any book off a shelf and flip to any page. I put my finger on a paragraph, Price wrote, and asked him to read it aloud. This he did at once, almost as quickly as the reader is pursuing this page. There was no sign of hesitation. Other books were placed in front of him, some with large print and some with small. He read them all. Bucks continued to impress the council with similar feats. His blindfolding method was key to his abilities. Bucks wouldn't allow a bag to simply be placed over his head. According to Price, this was because Bucks claimed that he sees through or by means of his nostrils. This explained why his nose was always in the clear. It sounds a bit absurd, but Romaines postulated a similar notion regarding eyeless sight. As Price explained, Romaines states it's necessary to leave the nostrils free in order that his blindfolded or blinded subjects shall distinguish colors. He says that the nasal mucosa is sensitive to light and to different colored regions of the spectrum. This function is sharply distinct from smell, he continues. The part played by the nasal mucosa leads us to the following question. Is the unknown organ of extra-retinal vision situated in one part of the body? Localized in a single one or diffused through many? Kuda Bucks answers that, in his case, the unknown organ is situated in his nose. Despite that, Price and his team concluded that Bucks was an extraordinary showman, but did not possess X-ray vision. During our test, Bucks would not allow us to adopt measures that absolutely precluded his seeing down the side of his nostrils, and although we witnessed a clever performance, all we learned that afternoon was how extremely difficult it is to blindfold a person using ordinary methods," Price wrote. Regardless of Price's conclusion, Bucks continued to perform his X-ray feats for audiences. However, three years later, at a demonstration with 300 people at a hotel, he was offered $10,000 if he could read with an ordinary bag over his head. The offer was made by Joseph Dunninger, a magician and president of the Universal Council for Psychical Research. Bucks declined, saying his soul only provided this power to read through obstacles if it were done his way. The show went on, and Bucks prepared his blindfolds in his usual fashion, which on this occasion included napkins from the hotel. He then read words on a blackboard, from newspapers and more. The audience was amazed. Yet, as a newspaper article described it, but always the nose of Kuda Bucks stuck out of the wrappings, and he tilted his head, back, in a way that might suggest to the skeptical that there was a slight gap in the dough down the left side of his nose through which he might be reading. 
A reporter asked if he could read a card he placed inside a napkin, one just like Bucks had used in his blindfolding. No, the napkin must be in contact with my body, the magician replied. He ended the demonstration and removed the bandages, dough, and napkins. The curious reporter grabbed one of the discarded napkins and pressed it to Bucks's head. I place it in contact with your forehead, the journalist said. There's no dough in the way now, only one of the several napkins through which you read before. Can you read the name of the bank in this blank check that I take out of my pocket? Bucks said he could not. The show was over. Psychologist attending the performance who had been impressed up until then suddenly grew disappointed. My goodness, he exclaimed, then this is only some sort of sleight of hand trick? Still, it was quite a trick. Dunninger explained to a newspaper how it worked. Reading while blindfolded is more than three centuries old and has been discarded by most magicians plying professions today. It's extremely simple and can be accomplished by most persons with some practice. The reading is done down along the side of the nose. The depression in the eyes and the bridge of the nose allows just enough space for one to peer down at the object as held in the so-called mystic's hands. If you'd like to watch Cuba Bucks perform a few tests or tricks in a 1938 video, I've placed a link in the show notes. When Weird Darkness Returns All families have their ups and downs. However, when you find a clan where an infanticide trial is arguably the least worst thing to happen to them, it's safe to say you have found one very special household. Coming up. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. You can get more Weird Darkness seven days a week through the Weird Darkness podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find it on YouTube, or just visit weirddarkness.com slash listen and find a list of all the apps where you can listen to the show. That's weirddarkness.com slash listen, or just listen to the show right there on the homepage at weirddarkness.com. The Mabbitt family, described by one newspaper as from good old farmer stock, lived just outside of Delphi, Indiana. They seemed like an ideal family. The father, Peter Mabbitt, was both wealthy and respectable. The children were all attractive, intelligent, and popular. The belle of the family was 23-year-old Luella, who naturally had many suitors. Her favored beau was a man ten years her senior named Amer Green, but for what may well have been very good reasons, her father disapproved of him. So strong was Mr. Mabbitt's dislike for Green that he was able to persuade Luella to write her lover a Dear John letter. Unfortunately, Green did not take his dismissal well. On August 6, 1886, William Walker, the swain of Luella's twin sister Ella, rode to the Mabbitt house and called Ella out for a chat. As the two were talking, Green appeared, demanding that Luella come out as well. When Ella told him her sister was asleep, Green lost his temper, snapping that if he didn't get to see Luella, he would tear the house apart. Luella, whether reluctantly or not is not recorded, went out to see Green. The two talked quietly for a few minutes, and then they walked off together. After a moment, Walker drove off, and Ella went back to the house, little guessing that this would be the last time she would ever see her sister. When Luella failed to return that night, her family was naturally alarmed. Equally inevitably, their first thought was to hunt down Ammer Green. 
The local police questioned both Walker and Green, but neither of them claimed to have any idea what had happened to Luella. A massive search was made of the area without finding any trace of the missing young woman. Peter Mabbitt hired a private detective and offered a substantial reward for any information about his daughter, but no clues emerged. It was as if Luella had simply evaporated into the air. When Amber Green quietly slipped out of town, that only hardened local certainty that he knew exactly what had become of Luella. On August 12, a mob of the lynching variety was soon assembled around the Green home, they dragged Amher's mother out, placed a noose around her neck, and demanded that she tell them where her son had gone. She either couldn't or wouldn't say. Eventually, the frustrated crowd let her go and left. As the prime suspect in the disappearance was unable to be found, police did the next best thing. They arrested Mrs. Green. William Walker was tossed into jail as well, apparently only because he had the bad luck to be on the scene the night Luella vanished. As it turned out, Amber wasn't the only member of his family with an alleged penchant for murder. His brother William had been accused of killing Juan Enos Brombot, and he too had fled justice. Pinkerton detectives eventually managed to track the pair down in Texas. They were arrested in July 1887 and brought back to Indiana. In the meantime, the mystery of the whereabouts of Luella Mabbitt had finally been solved. Maybe. In February 1887, a body was discovered in the Wabash River. It was so badly decomposed as to be unrecognizable. But Ella Mabbitt and her mother believed that these were Luella's remains, largely apparently on the grounds that the corpse's teeth resembled Ella's. Peter Mabbitt, on the other hand, was unconvinced. A physician who examined the body believed the teeth were of someone much older than Luella, and, furthermore, the corpse was that of a man. The uncertainty about these remains only ensured that the Mabbitt mystery was even more muddled than before. Meanwhile, Amher Green from his cell in the Carroll County Jail continued to insist that Luella was alive and well and living in Texas with a man named Samuel Payne. He refused to say any more than this, intimating that all would eventually be made clear. If Green truly did have evidence that Luella was still among the living, he was soon to regret keeping it to himself. Locals were convinced he was a murderer, but lacking a verified body or any other hard evidence that Green or anybody else had murdered Luella, it was looking increasingly unlikely that he would ever be convicted. The men of Delphi began to say that if the law could not punish Amber Green, well, they would have to do so themselves. On the night of October 21, 1887, some 200 men quietly marched through the streets, surrounding the county jail. They broke their way in and confronted the sheriff, demanding the keys to the prison. When he refused, some of the mob overpowered him, and the others used sledgehammers to break the locks leading to the cells. They went straight to the cell containing Amher Green. At gunpoint, he was seized and tied up. He was led outside and forced into a covered wagon. It drove off with the bulk of the crowd following. The wagon drove to the woods of Walnut Grove, about eight miles away. It was soon joined by a large caravan of carriages, wagons, and men on horseback. Green was taken out of the wagon and ordered to confess his guilt. Green maintained the stolid calm of a man who knows he's doomed. He quietly maintained that Luella was in Fort Worth. When asked why, if this was the case, she didn't come home and resolve the mystery, he replied, she would if I had the time to send for her. He claimed that Luella had been desperate to leave her home for some time, and on the night she vanished, he had merely assisted in her desire to run away. Among the crowd was Peter Mabbitt. He stepped forward and begged Green to tell the truth. What had he done with Luella? I loved her better than my own life, Green retorted. That is the reason I went away with her. I loved her better than you did, and all the times she's been away, I have cared for her. His words were not enough to convince a mob bent on murder. But the story isn't over yet. 
I'll tell you what happened when Weird Darkness returns. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Do you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know? Share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com, and I might use it in a future episode. When last we left the story, Armor Green was accused of murdering Luella, but he continued protesting his innocence, even saying, I loved her better than my own life. His words were not enough to convince a mob bent on murder. A rope was tied around a branch of a walnut tree, and the other end wrapped around Green's neck as he stood in the wagon seat. The wagon lurched forward, leaving the condemned man dangling in the air. When it was clear that Green was dead, the crowd soon dispersed, leaving the body hanging in the tree. Before the coroner took charge of it the next day, thousands of people came to gawk at the grotesque sight. Someone took a photograph of the hanging corpse, which was, I kid you not, turned into a postcard. Copies can be found online, but I strongly urge you not to try to find them. The men responsible for Green's lynching were never punished. To this day, Green's ghost is said to haunt the grove where he died. Green's death was not the end of the mystery. Detectives went to Fort Worth in an effort to track down this elusive Samuel Payne. Somewhat to their surprise, they found a Mrs. Orr, who claimed to have lived next door to Payne, and a woman who said that she was his wife. Mrs. Payne was a pretty woman in her early twenties, who told Mrs. Orr that she was originally from Indiana. Unfortunately, the couple had since left town for parts unknown. If this was, as Amher Green insisted with literally his dying breath, Luella Mabbitt, she was never heard from again. This was not the end of the Mabbitt family tragedies. In 1890, Luella's 17-year-old sister Minnie became pregnant. Upon hearing of the news, the baby's father, one Charles Spilter, promptly washed his hands of her. Not knowing where else to turn, Minnie sought the help of her brothers, Oris and Mont. They helped her check into the Indianapolis Hotel under the name of Mrs. Minnie Jones, where she gave birth to a daughter she named Merle. Soon after this, the body of a baby girl was discovered in Eagle Creek. The coroner determined that she had died of strangulation soon after birth. Two women from the hotel where many had stayed identified the baby as Merle. A buggy weight that had been used to weigh down the tiny corpse was determined to have come from the livery stable where Mont Mabbitt worked. It was also learned that on the night Minnie checked out of the hotel, Mont took one of the stable's buggies. Minnie, Mont, and Oris were all arrested. Minnie soon confessed all. She stated that she had believed her brothers would place her baby in an orphanage. She last saw the child when her brothers drove her in the direction of Eagle Creek. Mont took Merle from her and left their carriage. Oris and Minnie drove off for a while, and when they returned, Mont was waiting for them alone. The three then returned to the city. No one told me the baby was dead, said Minnie, but I knew it was. During her trial, the beautiful young Minnie won everyone's sympathy. It was universally believed that she was but a helpless child, completely under the control of her brothers. She was acquitted of murder, much to the approval of those in the courtroom. Eventually, Oris and Mont, who both argued that they had never intended to murder the baby, were also set free. In the legal sense, this was the end of the Mabbitt saga. The lingering question of just what exactly became of Luella Mabbitt was never resolved. For many years after that fateful night in August 1886, there were periodic sightings of the supposedly murdered woman. In February 1916, her sister Ella told a reporter, For all I know, my sister may have not been murdered and may be living today. If such was the case, 
Amber Green must rank as one of the unluckiest men in Indiana history. The following true story is written from the perspective of a female, so don't let that throw you. Let me begin by filling you in on my first house. The year was 1996 and I was pregnant with my first child. My ex-husband and I had been living with his parents far too long and with a baby on the way, we knew we simply had to get a place of our own. It had seemed that with the monthly income we made, this would be an almost impossible goal. That is, until we were made aware of an old house that his grandmother had owned that had just been sitting and unoccupied since the incident. The story goes, my ex-husband's grandma, uncle, and aunt had purchased an older home inside the city limits after the state had bought their home on the range in order to lay down the interstate and place a rest area back in the 1950s. So with their new lump of money, the three of them relocated to their new home. All I was told was that Eileen, the aunt, had been attacked and sexually assaulted by three men one evening in the alleyway behind the house. This unfortunate event took a toll on her and she quickly lost her mind, being forced by the state to be placed into the local insane asylum. Basically, her last days were spent in the house. Shortly after being admitted, she took her own life. Some time later, the grandmother took a fall down the front steps and required around-the-clock nursing care, and so she was also admitted into a nursing home. Shortly after her admittance, she passed away. In the end, the only one left in the house was the uncle, who reportedly was already mentally unstable, and I imagine that all of this was too much for him to bear. Apparently, he attempted to take his own life in this house by slashing his wrists. He was not successful and was also admitted into a facility for his own safety. So, here sat this house, with its tragic history all shut up for years, when we decided to try and talk the uncle into letting us live there dirt cheap. He seemed all too happy to have visitors and almost excited that someone wanted to live in his home, a home that at one point had meant so much to him and his family. I have a rich past of dealing with the paranormal and unexplainable, so the history of the house didn't really affect my decision. I just knew that I was having a baby and desired to have my own place. I felt the place just needed some sprucing up and thought by having some young people and the arrival of a new baby inhabiting it would be just what the house needed. My ex-husband worked the night shift at a local restaurant around that time and would sleep during the days, which wouldn't leave much time to get the place ready for moving in. I figured that while he was at work, in order to kill two birds with one stone, I would go and clean it up and give it a fresh coat of paint. The first night I decided to head over there and paint, I remember there being a very unwelcoming feeling about the place when I pulled up. I didn't let it stop me and grabbed my gear and headed inside. Once inside, I began to wonder if we made a bad decision about moving into the house. But I've always believed that once you start something, you should finish it and stick it out no matter what. So I took a couple of deep breaths, cleared my mind, and started in on the painting. I knew I was not alone, and that was fine. I kept hearing odd noises in different parts of the house. I was determined to get the painting done and was not going to let it deter me. That is, until I began to hear voices and hissing of sorts. I began to feel uneasy with that, but still I held true to the task. I was in the living room, and on the other side of the wall was the bathroom, which still had one of those metal chairs in the shower used for people who cannot stand up and take a shower on their own. I heard some scuffling in the bathroom and then what sounded like the metal chair being sat in abruptly or, or moved, so I stopped painting and listened some more. I hear the bathroom door shut and some more hissing. Standing there, not moving, still facing the wall with paint roller in hand, I'm just kind of waiting to see what comes next. I refused to look away from the wall in fear of maybe seeing something I would rather not see. I knew in that moment that the spirit, or whatever it was, 
was in the room with me, very near me. At that point, I figured that if I showed no fear, it would not do much. Next thing I knew, right next to my ear, I hear a whisper saying, Donnell. It knew my name. I dropped that roller right in the paint pan and left that place as quick as I could. All the lights still on, doors unlocked, and radio playing. You'd think I would have decided to revoke the decision to move in at that point, but the situation at my in-laws was less than desirable. I felt it just had to happen. Besides, what could really happen? How bad could it truly get? So I decided it would be best not to tell my ex of what had happened that night. I simply told him that the pregnancy had made me feel exhausted and that I thought it'd be best if we finished painting the house on his days off. We lived a total of three years on the house with only a handful of occurrences. One evening, while my husband was at work, I was up late and very pregnant, feeling the need to do some deep cleaning as the due date of the baby was very near. Us mothers refer to this as the nesting instinct. There I was, standing in the kitchen when I heard voices coming from the basement. It sounded strange, like that of a radio station that wasn't well-tuned, but it just kept on talking and then stopped. I walked over to the door that led to the basement and locked it. I decided that it would be a good idea to just keep that door locked at all times. I'd hear the voices in the basement often, and that was about it. I never mentioned it to my ex-husband. One morning while lying in bed, I happened to notice a set of faint handprints on the ceiling above me. I just thought, huh, that's an odd spot for handprints, considering that the ceilings were so high, but didn't think too much about it. On another occasion, we were heading to bed and had made it to the bedroom when the television turned on all by itself. My ex-husband and I just looked at each other and he walked over and shut it off. One night, I was awakened by yelling coming from the living room. As I laid there listening, it was obvious to me that the television had once again turned itself on and seemed like the volume was all the way up. I found myself once again laying in bed and staring at the ceiling and happened to notice that there were now a few sets of handprints. It seemed like each time I would look at that ceiling, there would always be more sets of handprints. In the dining room, there was always this big stain that no matter what I did, what company I hired to clean the carpet, the stain would always reappear. I found it rather peculiar. So I went and asked the uncle where exactly in the house did he cut his wrists, and he told me the dining room. After repeated attempts at getting rid of the stain, it became apparent that the stain was there to stay. I placed a throw rug over it as a solution to the problem. Voices in the basement, the television randomly turning on by itself, and unexplainable handprints were all that we had to deal with. Not so intolerable, right? Well, some time after our first child was born, the uncle in the middle of the night called me up desperately asking me to get him out of the nursing home he was in. So he came to live with us in his house. We'd been living there for over a year at that point. The paranormal activity seemed to cease once he was living with us. I became pregnant with our second child when our first was a year old. The pregnancy went accordingly, but around the time I was seven months along, I had an accident. It was wintertime, and the front steps were covered in ice. I had pleaded with my ex-husband to make the stairs ice-free several times, but he neglected to do so. We were going somewhere, and I was heading down the stairs when suddenly my feet slipped. In hopes of protecting the baby, I grabbed a hold of the stair rail and sort of aimed my body in a way to land on my back. Mind you, these were the very stairs that his grandmother had met her demise on. I was rushed to the hospital, and the baby and I were placed on 24-hour observation. Thankfully, we were all right, according to the ER doctors. However, the remainder of my pregnancy became extremely difficult. I had planned a natural birth, but turned out as an emergency C-section. When our second baby was merely two months old, my ex-husband's uncle decided to kick us out and take everything from us. We ended up moving out of that house then and never returned. However, when my second child was about 10 months old, I started getting very sick, not being able to hold down any food or any liquids, and 
a very drawn-out sickness that no one could pinpoint engulfed my life. After the whole runaround with numerous visits to the ER, specialists, and painful suffering, two years later the problem was finally found. Turned out that when I fell on those stairs during my second pregnancy, the jolt of the baby's body had crammed my spleen up against my pancreas and up against my spine. In results, killing my spleen, 60% of my pancreas, and severely damaging my spine. I nearly died because of that one fall, and it has ultimately stolen my physical health since I was 22 years of age. It caused a sort of spiral effect, and since then, I have known nothing other than surgeries and great physical pain. Looking back, I wish that I would have just stayed at my in-laws instead of moving into that house. At least I'd still have had my health. When Weird Darkness returns, is it possible that the infamous pirate Black Bart was actually forced into being a pirate? Having excellent navigation skills, courage, and charisma, when his vessel was captured, Bartholomew Roberts eventually became the most successful pirate of the Golden Age. The Golden Age of piracy spans between the 1650s to the 1730s. It was an intriguing and ruthless period in history when ships and the men and sometimes women who sailed them turned the oceans into an adventurous drama. Bartholomew Roberts' life was colorful and exciting. Between 1719 and 1722, he captured as many as 400 ships, including many superior warships. This made him the most wealthy and feared pirate of the Golden Age. It was his death and the trial of his crew in 1722 that symbolized the end of piracy's Golden Age. Born in 1682 in Wales, Bartholomew Roberts, whose original name was John Roberts, went to sea at the age of 13. Preparing for marine life, he continued sailing and in 1719 he earned a position as the second officer on board the ship Princess under Captain Abraham Plum. His ship was captured by Welsh pirate Howell Davis. Roberts was enslaved and forced to bemuse one of the pirates. However, this did not bother him much because he soon realized this trade suited him well. Roberts was an attractive, tall man who enjoyed nice clothes and expensive jewelry. As a pirate, he had an opportunity not only to be famous but also rich. Pirate crews needed frequent replenishing. Most pirates were volunteers, but casualties from combat, disease, accidents, and occasional desertions took their toll, so pirates took every opportunity they could to acquire new men. Since able seamen, maritime carpenters, coopers, and navigators were preferred, it was sensible for pirates to seek recruits from among the crews of the ships they took as prizes. Pirates did not like risking injuries to themselves or their prizes, so the captains or owners of the ships that ran or fought were frequently punished. For the rest of the men, pirates tried persuasion first. In truth, merchant crews were often overworked, underpaid, and unhappy. Other arguments might include praise for the democratic life of piracy, the promise of better food, clothing and accommodation, liquor, and, of course, wealth. For the potential recruits to accept these reasons, the pirates themselves would need to be better dressed and nourished than them, which argues against the popular image of pirates as gaunt and ragged vagabonds. Of course, if time was short or their arguments unconvincing, the pirates would then resort to force in order to fill out their crews. Bartholomew Roberts once said, In an honest service there is thin commons, low wages, and hard labor. In this plenty and satiety, pleasure and ease, liberty and power, and who would not balance creditor on this side when all the hazard that is run for it, at worst, is only a sour look or two at choking? No, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. 
time revealed Robert's boldness was one of the reasons he became more successful than other pirates. Captain Howell Davis liked Roberts, and so did the rest of the crew. Once Davis discovered Roberts was an excellent navigator, he took consulting in him. In time, once Roberts gained Davis's trust, the captain was able to confide information to Roberts, keeping it hidden from the rest of the crew. In June 1719, Davis and some of the pirates were killed in an ambush, and Roberts was selected as the new captain. Roberts' new life as a pirate was entering another stage. Once he and his fellow pirates had avenged Davis's death by destroying the harbor, they headed for the coast of South America to look for booty. Roberts was cunning and fooled many. He discovered 42 ships, and their escorts were waiting at Saints Bay off northern Brazil. Pretending he was just part of the convoy, he sailed into the bay and took one of the ships without anyone noticing. His eyes were set on the richest of the ships that he also captured quickly before the escorting ships had a chance to catch him. In June 1720, Roberts, who was later also known as Black Bart, captured 22 ships in the harbor, and then he and his crew continued to the Caribbean, where they captured dozens of vessels. Roberts, who called himself the Admiral of the Leeward Islands, had a couple of flags associated with him. One was a black flag bearing a skeleton representing death that held an hourglass in one hand and crossbones in the other. Another black flag, a white figure representing Roberts, holding a flaming sword and standing on two skulls. Below were the words ABH and AMH, standing for a Barbadian head and a Martinisos head. Roberts hated the governors of Barbados and Martinique because they had sent pirate hunters after him. Whenever Roberts encountered ships from either place, he showed them no mercy. Roberts was a very successful pirate, but he could be extremely cruel. On one occasion, he ordered to burn Porcupine, a ship full of slaves because its captain had refused to pay the ransom. In February 1722, Captain Shaloner Ogle, who commanded the warship Swallow, put a stop to Robert's piracy. Ogle and his crew engaged in a fierce battle against Roberts and his pirates. Roberts was killed by a grape shot, which struck him in the throat while he stood on the deck. His men fulfilled his wish and quickly threw his body into the sea. The life of Bartholomew Roberts, the greatest pirate of his generation, had come to an end. Roberts' pirates were helpless without their captain. They had only energy to fight for one hour after his death. Then they surrendered and were later put on trial. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media. Drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Genesis 5 verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And a final thought, I'm strong because I know my weaknesses. I'm wise because I've been foolish. I laugh because I've known sadness. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. There are few things in life more permanent and guaranteed than death. Yet that doesn't stop us from imagining what life would be like if death was only temporary. In numerous movies and TV shows, reanimated human corpses roam the world, having avoided the permanent stillness of death, only to devour the living. Now, we know zombies aren't real, but reanimated corpses aren't exactly a figment of the imagination. Both necromancers and scientists have been attempting to restore life to the dead 
for hundreds of years. In the 1800s, physicist Giovanni Aldini became famous for his spectacular demonstrations of reanimating human and animal corpses by stimulating them with powerful electrical shocks. He would hook a battery up to dismembered humans or animals and cause the corpse to convulse as though it were alive. Audience members were awestruck, despite the fact the creature never actually came back to life. Aldini knew he wasn't actually reviving the dead, though that didn't stop him from trying, and neither did the scientists who followed him. By the 1930s, attempts to resurrect the death with electricity had fizzled, but the fascination with reanimation was far from dead. One of the most famous scientists in the field of reanimation is Robert E. Cornish, an American biologist who studied at the University of California, Berkeley. Cornish reportedly managed to revive two dogs by rocking them back and forth to move blood around while injecting the animal with a mixture of anticoagulants and steroids. When Cornish announced he was ready to perform his experiment on humans, the California death row inmate, Thomas McMonagall, volunteered his body post-execution. But the state of California denied his request. Because, let's face it, the last thing we need is technology that can bring death row inmates back to life after their demise. That's a horror movie script in the making. Recently, a team of researchers from Yale University have been experimenting with reanimating pig brains and publishing their findings in April 2019's journal Nature. The scientists restored brain activity and some cellular activity in pigs a few hours after the animals died in a slaughterhouse. Although some brain cells began functioning again, it wasn't enough for the pigs to regain consciousness. Scientists not involved in the study told Live Science that the results throw into question what it means to be alive or brain dead. Zombies are most certainly fake, but a few remarkable case studies suggest that some semblance of spontaneous resurrection is possible. In 2011, 46-year-old woman Kelly Dwyer fell into a frozen pond while hiking alone in New Hampshire. Dwyer's heart stopped before the ambulance could reach her and her body temperature plummeted to near 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius, popular science reported. Dwyer had been dead for five hours, then doctors switched off life support, and her heart spontaneously started again. After spending two weeks recovering in the hospital, Dwyer returned home alive and with no brain damage. She wasn't a zombie, but in a sense, she had come back from the dead. Enough people have spontaneously come back to life several minutes after cardiac arrest that the instance has its own name – the Lazarus Phenomenon. Not all of the people who experience the Lazarus Phenomenon regain full neurological function or remain living for much longer, but a 2007 review estimated that about 35% of Lazarus Phenomenon patients return to a normal, healthy life. Even after hundreds of years of failed experiments, some scientists are still trying to manually reanimate human corpses. BioQuark Inc., a U.S. biotechnology company, has been attempting to recruit 20 clinically dead patients for an experiment on reversing brain death. A letter published in the journal Critical Care said the trial borders on quackery and dead means dead. Zombie fans might disagree, and so might necromancers. Perhaps the key to bringing the dead to life has nothing to do with science and everything to do with black magic, witchcraft, spells, potions, the time of day, and the weather outside. While scientists have been trying for hundreds of years to bring the dead back to life, necromancers have been claiming for even longer to have been succeeding at it. But can we believe that? can we bring someone back from the dead to speak to them once again? There are all kinds of ways in which the dead differ from the living. Psychology professor Richard Wiseman recently said, and one of them is that dead people tend to be rather particular about who they talk to. The dead, he continued, prefer chatting to people who are imaginative, creative, highly sensitive. 
the professor gives a barely perceptible nod in my direction. You know, the credulous, the gullible, and the deluded. Well, that escalated quickly. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… The people of Japan have a myth of a terrible, snake-like creature with death-dealing powers called a Tsuchinoko. But unlike many legends, there have been modern sightings of this bizarre cryptid. Is it real? If so, what could it be? At the age of only 14, George Stinney Jr. was the youngest person in history to be put to death in the electric chair. Then, 70 years later, he was proven innocent. But first, I'm pretty sure that unless you were born of a virgin, died, and then rose from the grave three days later, no one has had any real success at bringing people back from the underworld. But that is exactly what people who practice necromancy try to do. They can't be successful at it, though. Or can they? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. One thing most ancient civilizations share is a fascination with the afterlife. The art of necromancy, communicating beyond the grave through messages to ghosts or the reanimation of deceased flesh, has long been regarded as a deviant way to find answers in the realm of the underworld. Although it has been practiced in some way in nearly every ancient civilization, necromancy began primarily in ancient Persia. Greece, Rome, and medieval Europe. Referred to more commonly as sorcery or black magic, necromancy derives from the Greek words necros, meaning dead body, and manteia, meaning divination. It is the magical process of bringing the deceased to life with the intent of learning their secrets, a way to read the future, discover the unknown, or just exploit the wisdom of the grave. It's been the subject of many forbidden doctrines and is still used in some religions today. Although first considered by the ancient Greeks as a way to descend into the underworld of Hades, necromancy eventually evolved into the act of summoning the departed into the mortal world, often against their will and with grave consequences. Pet cemetery, anyone? Talking to the deceased is not for the faint of heart, and the lore surrounding what necromancy is can be equally as terrifying. Necromancy is most commonly associated with witches and witchcraft. Since ancient days, tales of witches using necromancy for power and insight have appeared in legends and lore from multiple cultures. Part of this association comes from the belief that witches work with spirits, including those of humans, animals, plants, and the earth itself. One of the more memorable stories is the story of Sextus Pompey, who, in the Roman poet Lucan's epic, sought out the help of Erichtho, a Thessalian witch known to be both horrifying and dangerous. Regardless of her reputation, Sextus was desperate to know the outcome of the civil war before it happened. 
Eric, though, was a serious necromancer who set up residence in a graveyard to facilitate her conversations with the deceased and promised to help Sextus with his query. In a gruesome scene, she wandered a battlefield in search of a cadaver whose neck and lungs still allowed him to speak, and when she found one, she and Sextus brought the body into a cave where the witch prepared it for her ritual. Calling on the help of Hermes, the guide of the dead, and other supernatural powers, she successfully summoned the spirit and the soldier's body was reanimated. The animated body then described for Sextus the bleak civil war on the horizon and the inevitability of his own early death. Despite the bad omen from the spirit, Sextus was satisfied because, above all else, he knew his fate. Necromantic rituals could be both mundane and grotesque, depending on their purpose, but they were almost always elaborate, often involving talismans, incantations, magic circles, candles, symbols, and wands. The necromancer might wear the clothes of the deceased, sit for days without moving, or even mutilate and eat corpses as a way to call out to the other side. They would choose melancholy locations that were well-suited to their guidelines, perhaps the home of the deceased subject, a ruin, or a dark graveyard. All of these morbid practices were just the warm-up for the eventual summoning of the spirit. According to folklore about necromancy, in order to raise a physical body from the other side, the process had to occur within one year of the death. Otherwise, the necromancer would only be able to evoke the ghost, not the real person. These days, existing practices of necromancy relate to the spiritualism of certain cultures who still believe the dead can lead the living into a realm of understanding. For example, necromancy is still practiced in the Afro-Brazilian religion Quimbanda, which purports that there are several types of spirits, including a group of female spirits called Pombagiras and a group of male spirits called Exas, who can be called on for aid. People who practice Quimbanda ask spirits to help them with specific tasks. But what do the dead really know? This question has been up for debate throughout the centuries. Roman poet Ovid wrote in the Metamorphosis that many felt the dead converged in an underworld marketplace where they exchanged news and gossip. Others thought they were much more sinister, including Jews and Christians. Many books of the Bible offer warnings against necromancy, fortune-telling, and false prophets. In the eyes of most Christians, bringing back non-living spirits was and still is nothing short of demon summoning. They believe that regardless of any perceived benefits, raising the dead goes in the face of God's authority and only leads to suffering. The medieval world typically believed that the resurrection of the dead required God's help, thereby labeling all other kinds of divination and spirit communication as requiring the help of evil spirits. Even though many Catholics pray to deceased saints for their departed loved ones, the Bible and the Catholic Church condemn necromancy as a magical practice. The first literary mention of necromancy appeared in Homer's Odyssey, when the powerful sorceress Circe traveled to the underworld with Odysseus to determine the success of his impending voyage home. By raising the spirit of the prophet Tiresias, who was known for his clairvoyance, they hoped to gain insight into Odysseus's future. In this depiction of necromancy, Odysseus followed the rituals of his culture and made offerings to the underworld gods and the blood sacrifice of a sheep, which acted as a special drink for ghosts, enabling them to speak. He spoke to several ghosts and was given warnings. Odysseus pandered to the dead as a way to ensure his future success and to gain insight into a realm where humans had no such visions. Odysseus was desperate to ascertain his fate no matter what the cost. This theme of desperation for knowledge, despite the religious and ethical implications of necromancy, reappear frequently in history. Despite it being a controversial form of black magic, many clerics in the Middle Ages studied and practiced necromancy. These medieval scholars believed necromancy could help them achieve many feats, both personal and spiritual, and they used their clerical training to perform the rituals correctly. It was believed 
necromancy could obtain answers from the dead that could solve real-life problems, like finding missing items, identifying culprits in crimes, or even predicting the future. According to author Robert Masello, in a typical ritual of necromancy, once the coffin was unsealed, the body would be removed and laid out with its head pointing east toward the rising sun, and its limbs assuming the position of crucifixion. A small dish of burning wine, mastic, and sweet oil would then be placed near the right hand of the body to promote conjuration. Of course, the incantations varied greatly between cultures, but all seemed to focus on commanding the spirit to move in the name of the deceased person and to answer the demands of the living. Assuming the ritual went according to plan, the body of the dead would slowly rise and dutifully answer the questions of the necromancer. The spirit would be rewarded for its cooperation by promises of future peace, and the body would be burned or buried in quicklime afterward so it could never be reanimated again. As one would expect, the best time to perform necromancy was at midnight, especially if the night was filled with wind, rain, and lightning, because it was believed that spirits would show themselves more readily in stormy weather. Although practices varied from place to place, the majority of rituals involved lighting the scene with torches and creating a backdrop of deep contemplation and morbidity. For example, if a necromancer wanted to raise a corpse from a cemetery, magic circles would be drawn around the grave and certain powerful plants were burned, including hemlock, mandrake, and opium. Even today, there are people who claim they can speak to the dead. Modern necromancers cultivate working relationships with the departed through things like the art of throwing bones, where the future is read based on their placement. Working with the quote-unquote energy of the dead is the contemporary version of reanimation, and it tries to avoid brutality and the desecration of burial sites. But despite a surprisingly robust online necromancy community, the ancient art of bringing dead things to life is mostly gone. Probably because there's no evidence anyone has actually done it. While there is plenty of literature on the subject and contemporary witches who claim to know the old ways, it's clear that necromancy is not what it used to be. Shunioko is a legendary ancient creature that appears in Japanese myths. Interestingly, people in modern times report having encountered the fearsome snake-like being. Does this mysterious creature exist only in the realm of mythology, or could it be an unknown new species? In Japanese mythology and folklore, Sushinoko is a legendary ancient creature that appears in Japanese myths. Interestingly, people in modern times report having encountered the fearsome snake-like being, and I'm not talking about video games. Does this mysterious creature exist only in the realm of mythology, or could it be an unknown new species? In Japanese mythology and folklore, Sushinoko is described as a creature having a thick belly. The Japanese word for Sushinoko means child of hammer or child of dirt. In northeastern Japan, the peculiar being is known as Bashihebi. Like many other mythological creatures, Sushinoko often displays supernatural abilities uncommon for animals that we're familiar with. What do you think some of those supernatural abilities are? Take a guess, and we'll find out if you're right when Weird Darkness returns. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, trucker caps, dad hats, school supplies, 
kids' clothes, coffee mugs, and more of the merch in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from, and a variety of colors and sizes to match you. Grab some Weirdo merchandise for yourself, or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life, by clicking on store at weirddarkness.com. That's weirddarkness.com slash store. We were talking about Japan's mythological creature, Tsuchinoko, which means child of hammer or child of dirt, and it displays supernatural abilities that are uncommon for animals we are familiar with. For example, despite its small size being only between 30 and 80 centimeters, that's 12 and 31 inches in length, Tsuchinoko can jump very high up in the air. It often makes several jumps, one after another. This mysterious creature was mentioned for the first time in the Kojiki, a text from the 8th century which is Japan's oldest existing chronicle and the oldest book written in Japanese. Japanese folklore stories tell the Sushinoko possesses the ability to speak and enjoy alcohol. It's a creature that often lies and swallows its tail. In some ways, Sushinoko resembles the legendary American hoop snake. Sushinoko is said to inhabit deep, remote mountains, and the animal's color varies, but it's mostly described as a black or dark brown creature having a thick orange belly. Some years ago, an unusual reptile was discovered in Makata, a town located in Makata District, Hyogo, Japan. Its peculiar appearance brought the legend of Sushinoko alive again. Since no one's ever found a real Sushinoko, it was difficult to determine if the unknown reptile was the same legendary snake mentioned in ancient Japanese tales. However, according to local government official Toshikazu Miyawaki, the animal found in Makita might have been the Tushinoko. Its body was very thick and short. Several people also heard its squeak. It's not the first time reports of Tushinoko reached media. In the opening years of the 21st century, there was another Tushinoko boom, this one occurring when a farmer in a small town in Okayama Prefecture found the remains of a mysterious creature. The discovery set off a frenzy in the mass media with tabloid newspapers, magazines, and television shows capturing people's attention. Eventually, the body was examined by a biologist who pronounced it probably a Yamakagashi, a tiger keelback snake, Robdophus tigrinus, but not a normal one. The town itself had quickly become identified with the Tushinoko. There had been earlier sightings as well, and today, Tushinoko is a local brand. You can, for example, buy Tushinoko wine. Alleged sightings of Tushinoko keep pouring in, but this little creature remains as elusive as ever, refusing to give up its identity and reveal its hiding place. Modern scientists still discovered many previously unknown creatures, so it's very possible there is a snake-like animal somewhere that once gave rise to the Tushinoko legends but researchers have not been able to confirm its existence. Yet. Perhaps Tushinoko resides not in mountains, but rather inhabits the deep underwater realm because it's a semi-aquatic animal. One should not dismiss the possibility of Tushinoko being a new species awaiting discovery. However, currently it's still classified as yokai, a mysterious, supernatural creature mentioned in Japanese mythology. Fourteen-year-old George Junius Stinney was convicted of murdering two white girls, the youngest person to be electrocuted by an electric chair. His conviction was overturned 70 years later. Nothing like that ever happened in the sawmill village of Alcolu. Alcolu was a place anchored by the lumber mill where both men and women went to church twice on Sundays, and green fields teemed with balls of cotton every summer before bursting into clouds of white fuzz each fall. According to official documents, on March 24, 1944, Betty June, age 11, and Mary Emma Thames, age 7, were riding their bicycles in the black part of Alkulu 
looking for flowers. George Stinney Jr., a seventh grader, was out with his younger sister. When they saw Stinney outside, they stopped and asked if he knew where to find Maypops, a local name for passion flowers. Betty and Mary never made it home that day. The white girl's disappearance prompted hundreds of Alcolu residents to come together in search for the missing girls. A search party of 100 to 200 men fanned out across town. The Stinney family had gotten word of the missing girls that evening while attending a party in the neighborhood. George told his parents that he'd seen them earlier and he left with his father to join the search parties. The girls were found the next morning, but sadly in a water-filled ditch with their skulls smashed in. Later that day, medical examiner A.C. Bozard performed an autopsy on the girls and determined their cause of death to be blunt force trauma. Bozard concluded that both the girls had been struck multiple times in the head with a small, round head about the size of a hammer. Both girls' skulls were punctured. Then, the law enforcement officers found out from witnesses that Betty and Mary were last seen talking to Stinney. The officers handcuffed him and Stinney was taken to the Sumter County Jail. George Stinney was interrogated for hours in a locked room with no witnesses or an attorney. The reports differed to what kind of weapon had been used. According to the police reports, Stinney confessed to murdering Betty and Mary after his plan to have sex with one of the girls failed. The medical examiner reported no evidence of sexual assault to the younger girl, though the genitalia of the older girl was slightly bruised. George Stinney and his older brother Johnny were arrested on suspicion of murdering the girls. Stinney was not allowed to see his parents until after his trial and conviction. Johnny was later released to the cops. According to a handwritten statement, the arresting officer was H. S. Newman, a Clarendon County deputy, who stated, I arrested a boy by the name of George Stinney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches where he said he put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle. No confession statement signed by Stinney is known to exist. The 14-year-old claimed that the arresting officers starved him and then bribed him with food to confess. After the arrest of George Stinney, his father was fired from his job and his family had to immediately vacate their company housing. The community and police threatened them if they did not leave immediately. Thirty-one days after his arrest, George Stinney appeared at the Clarendon County Courthouse in downtown Manning, the county seat. George was dressed in jeans and a faded blue shirt. George looked calm and apparently little concerned, a newspaper in Columbia reported. The trail began at a Clarendon County courtroom, where the court-appointed defense attorney, Charles Plowden, did almost nothing to defend his client, Stinney. Charles did not challenge the prosecution's presentation of two different versions of what really happened. In one version, Stinney was attacked by the girls after he tried to help one girl who had fallen in the ditch and he killed them in self-defense. In the other version, he had followed the girls, first attacking Mary Emma and then Betty June. The most significant piece of evidence presented on the court was Stinney's alleged confession, but there was no written record of the teen admitting to murders. Trial prosecutors called three police officers and three witnesses, Rev. Francis Batson, who discovered the bodies of the two girls, and the two doctors who performed post-mortem examination. The all-white jury took less than ten minutes to deliberate, after which they found George Stinley guilty of first-degree murder and the judge, Philip H. Stoll, sentenced him to death by electric chair. No appeal was filed by his defense attorney, and there is no transcript of the trial. Between the time of his arrest and his execution, Stinney's family was allowed to see him only once, later denied to see him a second time under threat of lynching. On June 16, 1944, George Stinney Jr. walked into the execution chamber at the South Carolina State Penitentiary in Columbia with a Bible under his arms. The Bible he was carrying was later used as a booster seat because he was too small for the chair. Stinney was then restrained by his arms, legs, and body to the chair. At the final moments, his father was allowed to approach George to say his final words to his son. When an officer asked George if he had any last words, George just shook his head. A few moments later, officials turned on the switch. 
2,400 volts surged through Stinney's body. George Stinney Jr. was declared dead after eight minutes and 83 days after the murders of Betty June Binnaker and Mary Emma Thames. For a long time, his grave was unmarked in hopes that anonymity would allow him to forever rest in peace. George Stinney's first-degree murder conviction was first appealed in 2014. George's siblings claimed that he was pressured and that he had an alibi, his younger sister, Amy, who was with him at the time of the murders. In fact, Stinney's cellmate at the Sumter County Jail claimed that Stinney always denied murdering Betty and Mary. After a year of consideration, on December 17, 2014, Judge Carmen T. Mullen overturned Stinney's first-degree murder conviction, stating that his sentencing was cruel and unusual. She wrote that there was a violation of the defendant's procedural due process rights that tainted his prosecution. Mullen wrote, No one can justify a 14-year-old child charged, tried, convicted, and executed in some 80 days, including that, in essence, not much was done for this child when his life lay in the balance. Up next on Weird Darkness, they were cigar-shaped, glowing red, and could turn on a dime, which ruled out even the most sophisticated rockets of the time. What is it that World War II fighter pilots were seeing in the skies flying with them? The UFOs of World War II, up next. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you or somebody you know struggles with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There I've gathered numerous free resources to help you fight depression, including the Crisis Text Line, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, Save.org, iFred, and more. These resources are absolutely free, and they are there when you need them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. It was nearly the end of World War II, but for the airmen of the 415th Night Fighter Squadron, it felt more like the beginning of War of the Worlds. Lt. Fred Ringwald was the first to see it. He was riding as observer in a night fighter piloted by Lt. Ed Schlater with Lt. Donald J. Myers on radar. It was a late November evening in 1944, partly cloudy with a quarter moon. They were roaming the Rhine Valley just north of Strasbourg on the French-German border when Ringwald said, I wonder what those lights are over there in the hills, according to an American Legion magazine story on the sightings from 1945. There were eight to ten of them in a row, glowing fiery orange. Then Schlater saw them off his right wing. They checked with Allied ground radar, but they registered nothing. Thinking that the lights might be some kind of German air weapon, Schlater turns the plane to fight only to have the lights vanish. At first, the men said nothing, fearing they'd be ostracized, but then the sightings spread through the unit. On December 17, 1944, near Breisach, Germany, a pilot was flying at approximately 800 feet when he saw five or six flashing red and green lights in T-shape. The lights seemed to follow him, closing in to about 8 o'clock and 1,000 feet, before disappearing as inexplicably as they came. Then on December 22nd, two more flight crews sighted lights. One crew near Hagenau reported two lights in a large orange glow, seeming to rise from the earth to 10,000 feet, tailing the fighter for approximately two minutes. After that, the lights peel off and turn away, fly a long level for a few minutes and then go out. They appear to be under perfect control at all times, according to Keith Chester's book, Strange Company, Military Encounters with UFOs in World War II, which I've placed a link to in the show notes. And then there was Lieutenant Samuel A. Crazy's experience. 
a wingless, cigar-shaped object glowing red just a few yards off the plane's wingtip. Lt. Creasney, justifiably spooked, instructed the pilot to attempt evasive maneuvers, but the glowing object stayed right next to the jet for several minutes before it flew off and disappeared. Eventually, the airmen named the lights Foo Fighters, inspired by the comic strip Smokey Stover, in which Smokey, a firefighter, would often declare, where there's foo, there's fire. An Associated Press reporter broke news of the Foo Fighter sightings on January 1, 1945, and theories about their origins quickly abounded. The sightings were flares or weather balloons or St. Elmo's fire, a phenomenon where a light appears on the tips of objects in stormy weather. But the members of the 415th rejected all those theories. Flares and weather balloons can't track planes like these objects could, and they'd seen St. Elmo's fire and could distinguish the two. Then there were those who claimed that the airmen were suffering from combat fatigue, a polite way of saying that war stress was driving them insane. But there was scant evidence to suggest collective psychosis. The 415th had an otherwise excellent record, and when a reporter for American Legion magazine went to report on the squadron, he described them as very normal airmen whose primary interest was combat, and after that came pinup girls, poker, donuts, and the derivatives of the grape. Lieutenant Krasny's son, Keith Krasny, says his late father didn't fit the stereotypical profile of a UFO theorizer. In fact, he never even suggested that the glowing wingless cigar-like object that flew next to his plane was extraterrestrial in origin. He was very level-headed, very analytical, says Krasny of his father, adding that he kept a notebook where he wrote about and drew his Foo Fighter sighting. But although he never seemed prone to conspiracy theories, Krasny says his father was open to one. He entertained the idea that it could be late-breaking German technology. He did express the view that there were a lot of things during the war that were kept quiet. Holding Nazi Germany responsible for the flying glowing orbs isn't too far-fetched. For one thing, the sightings took place over Nazi-occupied Europe, at a time when Germans' Luftwaffe was making tremendous strides. Then there's the fact that the sightings stopped once the German army was defeated. But the most compelling link to the Foo Fighters might be Werner von Braun, a 32-year-old Wunderkind rocket engineer. Von Braun helped the Nazis develop the V-2 rocket, a long-range guided ballistic missile that Hitler was using in 1944 against Belgium and other parts of Allied Europe. It's not too hard to imagine pilots, unfamiliar with long-range ballistics, comparing these rockets to cigar-like wingless planes. The V-2 could even explain the glow, since its tail emitted a long-burning plume. Nicholas Veronico, an author who has written several books on military aviation history, says that explanation comes up short. The V-2 rocket doesn't have the maneuverability, he says. It couldn't turn on a dime and change its acceleration pattern. Once it started burning, it burned and produced thrust at one rating. Nothing in Nazi Germany's military aviation arsenal can explain the Foo Fighter description, Veronico says. One airman's observation from the time, that the Foo Fighters follow the fighters so closely as to seem almost magnetized to them, is particularly confounding, given that there just wasn't the propulsion of metallurgical technology that could enable something like that. And yet, von Braun's career after World War II is worth considering. Following the collapse of the Third Reich, the engineer was recruited to be part of Operation Paperclip, a clandestine U.S. military program that spared 1,600 Nazi scientists' prosecution for war crimes, moving them instead into the American military, where their past was whitewashed to the public. By 1952, von Braun had reinvented himself as a spaceflight advocate, writing a piece that year in Collier's Magazine declaring that, within the next 10 or 15 years, the Earth will have a new companion in the skies a man-made satellite that could be either the greatest force for peace ever devised or one of the most terrible weapons of war, depending on who makes and controls it. His prediction proved overly conservative. The Soviets launched Sputnik 1 only five years later. Von Braun helped the U.S. Army launch Explorer 1 shortly thereafter. 
By 1960, he was with NASA, where he became the chief architect on Saturn V, the rocket that sent Neil Armstrong and the Apollo 11 crew to the moon. As von Braun recast himself as an American patriot, his career in the Nazi party shadowed him, an ambiguous secret that reporters would playfully poke at. At one press conference before an Apollo launch, a reporter asked von Braun to assure the press that the rocket wouldn't hit London but they could never prove his involvement, and it was only in 1985, several years after von Braun's death, that CNN broke news of the full extent of the aerospace engineer's Nazi past, more than 40 years after the fact. Veronica hopes the Foo Fighter narrative will follow a similar trajectory. The fantasy is that a hundred years after the war, the U.S. or Soviets will release information about what they captured, and it'll blow all our minds but I think they would have capitalized on it by this point, the historian says. Or weaponized it. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. I also have two bonus stories to share in the podcast version of tonight's show, including It Was the Slaying That Shocked Australia. Sometime on the night of December 26, 1898, Michael Murphy and his two younger sisters were slaughtered as they traveled back from Gatton in southeastern Australia. Their murders prompted a massive investigation, yet the crime remains unsolved to this day. Plus, a snowy November day, a bus full of students, and an icy lake. It was about to become the day of the worst school-related accident in Washington State history. Both stories are in the podcast version of tonight's show which you can get at WeirdDarkness.com. Visit the website and you can also follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And a final thought. Every day may not be good, but there is something good in every day. Alice Morse Earl. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The small town of Gatton, which in 2011 had a little less than 7,000 residents, lies some 60 miles west of Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. In the late 19th century, it was a popular waypoint for rail and road traffic traveling east to the coast or west to the fertile region of Darling Downs. The Murphy family owned a farm about eight miles outside of Gatton and 29-year-old Michael was home for the holidays that fateful December in 1898. On the afternoon of the 26th, Michael borrowed a one-horse sulky cart from his brother-in-law, William M. Neal, to take his sisters, Nora, 27, and Teresa, Ellen, 19, to a dance at the Divisional Board Hall in Gatton. Before they arrived, however, Michael received word that the dance had been canceled, so he turned the sulky around and headed home with his family no one made it back alive. The next morning, the Murphy family awoke to find that Michael, Nora, and Ellen were missing. Meniel set out looking for them, 
he followed the road into Gatton on horseback, keeping an eye out for the crooked tracks of his sulky, which had a wobbly wheel from an earlier accident. He soon found the distinctive tracks, which veered off the road and into a wooded pasture. The sight did not arouse suspicion just yet. Even as the three figures came into view, Manil presumed they were sleeping. It wasn't until he saw the ants crawling across their bodies that he realized what had happened. The scene was grisly and decidedly strange. Michael and Ellen lay back to back within a few feet of one another, while Nora lay nearby on a neatly spread rug soaked in blood. All three had their legs carefully arranged with the feet pointing to the west, one of the many odd details that remain a mystery. The two women had their hands tied behind their backs, while Michael's hands appeared to have been tied and then untied again, possibly to access a purse found near his body. Speculation later arose as to whether Michael's hands had been untied by the killer, by Emil himself, or by some other visitor who stumbled across the bodies before the police secured the crime scene. At a glance, it appeared as if all three of the Murphys had been bludgeoned to death. In Nora's case, her skull was so badly damaged that her brain protruded. Post-mortem examinations revealed that Nora had also been strangled and that Michael had been shot in the head before being struck. The blow from the blunt instrument partially disguised the bullet hole. In addition, the women may have been raped, possibly with the brass-mounted handle of a riding whip. The sulky stood nearby, at an angle to the bodies. The horse had been shot in the head, and its dead body lay between the shafts of the sulky. A distraught Emil raced toward Gatton, stopping first at the Bryanborough Hotel where he told patrons of the murder. He then pressed on to alert local police. A crowd of people left the hotel and hurried to the crime scene as Emil sought authorities. Even after Emil alerted police, a subsequent communications breakdown within the department led to additional delays. By the time investigators finally arrived at the pasture in full force, nearly two days after the bodies were discovered, spectators had completely contaminated the area. Police collected more than 3,000 statements in weeks after the slaying, yet their investigation was plagued by mistakes and accusations of incompetence. After inconsistencies arose between reports from the crime scene and the post-mortem examination, Chief Inspector Stewart ordered the bodies to be exhumed and re-examined. The examination uncovered previously missed evidence, including a bullet lodged in Michael's skull. Such errors led to rumors ranging from corruption within the police force to sinister interference from the Murphy family. While numerous individuals were suspected, no one was ever charged in the attacks. Anger over the perceived mishandling of the case led in part to a royal commission in 1899, which investigated the methods of the Queensland police force. For many amateur detectives, the most likely culprit is a man known variously as Theo Farmer, Thomas Ferner, and Thomas Day. Day was employed by a local butcher in December 1898 and was reportedly lurking near the murder scene on the night of the killings. Some suspect that he was also responsible for another murder just a few weeks before, when 15-year-old Alfred Stephen Hill was killed in a nearby Oxley. The boy's pony was shot in the head, much like the Murphy horse. In 1900, Day was admitted to the Sydney Hospital under the name Thomas Ferner, where he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. It is said that he left behind a suicide note admitting that he was present during the Gatton murders and stating that he couldn't sleep due to nightmares of seeing the victims' heads being bashed in. Such a claim only compounds the mystery. Was Day the actual killer? Or did he witness the slaying committed by another hand? More than a hundred years later, the Gatton murders case is haunted by unanswered questions. On November 26, 1945, the driver of a Lake Chelan School District bus 
carrying 20 young students and a woman, skids off South Lakeshore Road during a snowstorm and plunges down a 30-foot embankment into Lake Chelan. The woman and five children managed to escape through broken windows and reach the shore, but the driver and 15 students drown in the icy waters. Two bodies are recovered soon after the accident, but the bus and remaining 14 victims disappear. After searching for a week, Navy divers finally find the bus sitting precariously on a ledge in more than 200 feet of water. The bus is carefully hoisted to the surface but it contains the bodies of only four students and the driver. Lake Chelan has a reputation of never yielding its dead, and the bodies of the missing nine victims will never be recovered. It is the worst school-related accident in Washington state history. Lake Chelan, located in central Washington state, is approximately 55 miles long, varies from one to two miles wide and is the third deepest freshwater lake in the United States, measuring more than 1,500 feet deep in places. The name Chelan is a modification of Chil'an, the Indian name for the lake, meaning deep water. Fed by glaciers in the Cascade Mountains, the lake flows into the Columbia River via the Chelan River. The Lake Chelan Dam, built in 1927 at the lake's outlet to generate hydroelectric power, raised the water level 21 feet, requiring construction of new roads on the adjacent mountainsides. Tragically, the new lakeshore roads were unimproved and lacked safety barriers. On Monday morning, November 26, 1945, Royal J. Jack Randall, a Lake Chelan School District bus driver, was proceeding on his normal route along the west side of the lake from 25 Mile Creek to Chelan, picking up schoolchildren. Mrs. Glenna Brown caught a ride on the bus, hoping to keep a dental appointment in Chelan. It had started snowing, but there was only a light accumulation on the unpaved road, so he didn't bother putting on tire chains. But the snowstorm intensified, limiting his vision. Randall, a World War II veteran, had spent 26 months on Attu in the Aleutian Islands as an Army truck driver, so he wasn't intimidated by severe winter weather. According to surviving witnesses, approximately nine miles from Chelan, now Lake Chelan State Park, a heavy accumulation of snow on the windshield stopped the wipers from working. Unable to see, Randall pulled the bus off the roadway to clear the windshield. However, the bus struck an outcropping of rock, sending it diagonally across the road over a 50-degree, 30-foot embankment. The bus rolled over twice and came to rest on its right side up on a large boulder, with the front end five feet underwater. Randall, injured and trapped behind the steering wheel, ordered everyone to get out. There was a mass confusion as the students frantically looked for ways to escape. Marie Condon, a student, managed to kick out a window near the back. But as she and others left the bus, it became overbalanced and slid off the rock. Only six passengers managed to escape before the bus disappeared into the lake. The survivors were Mrs. Glenna Brown, age 37, Donald Mack, age 13, Ethel Keck, age 9, Robert Watson, age 8, Peggy Rice, age 16, and Marie Condon, age 17. Having escaped through the broken window, Donald Mack swam ashore and clambered up the steep embankment. He found a U.S. Forest Service emergency telephone box on a nearby utility pole and called for help. On the road, Mack was joined by Robert Watson and Marie Condon, and they flagged down passing cars, telling the drivers that the school bus had gone into the lake. Peggy Rice was credited with dragging most of the survivors from the water to safety on the embankment. Ironically, the first car at the scene was driven by her father, Albert R. Rice, who, with his son Alan, had been a few minutes behind the school bus. After helping Glenna Brown, Peggy Rice, and Ethel Keck up the embankment, they looked for more survivors but found none. Then Albert Rice and other motorists took the survivors to the hospital in Chelan for medical attention. School officials were unsure how many students were in the bus. It was nearly 1 p.m. when an accurate count and their identities were finally established. Meanwhile, as the alarm spread, emergency vehicles were arriving at the scene from all over Chelan County. The Chelan Fire Department with a resuscitator was the first to arrive and stood by all day and into the night. The Washington State Patrol and Chelan County Sheriff's Office 
established roadblocks to control traffic through the area. The Forest Service erected a shelter over the nearby emergency telephone that provided direct communications with Chelan and the outside world. The Red Cross set up a small canvas tent on the bank, providing the rescue workers with hot coffee and sandwiches. A tugboat and a 100-foot oar barge belonging to the Howe Sound Mining Company were moored at the water's edge above the sunken bus to use as a platform for diving operations. But nothing could be done to retrieve the bodies or raise the bus until men with diving equipment arrived. Meanwhile, the snow continued falling heavily, about an inch per hour. Late that afternoon, the two U.S. Bureau of Reclamation trucks arrived from Grand Coulee Dam, loaded with deep-sea diving equipment and air compressors. After donning their equipment, the divers, brothers Colin and D.S. Mac O'Donnell, finally entered the water at 6.10 p.m. Since it was night, the divers used battery-operated spotlights to search the underwater embankment for any sign of the vehicle. They recovered the body of Henry Davis, age 16, and continued searching until 6.35 p.m. without further success. Limited by the length of their air hoses, they were only able to descend 130 feet on the first dive and sent for more air hose. Later that evening, Ben Thorson, a Washington water power diver, arrived from Spokane with a truckload of equipment. Meantime, the weather continued hindering rescue and salvage attempts. On Tuesday, November 27, 1945, the O'Donnells recovered the body of Foreman Ronald Ayers, age 13, and followed a trail down a rock ravine marked by scarred rocks, yellow paint scrapings, and broken glass. At 200 feet, the divers came to a ledge and the visible end of the trail. It was also the limit to which they could safely descend without special equipment. Recovery efforts were temporarily abandoned and buoys were placed in the water, marking the spot where the bus disappeared and floating debris, papers, lunchbox, and clothing had been spotted. At the request of the Washington State Patrol, the 13th Naval District in Seattle agreed to take over the recovery operation and dispatched a team of diving specialists and equipment to the lake. On Wednesday morning, November 28, 1945, Walter McRae, an underwater salvage expert from Seattle, and seven Navy divers from Naval Air Station Whidbey Island arrived in Chelan with helium diving equipment and a portable decompression chamber, allowing divers to descend to about 450 feet. After talking to the original divers and analyzing surroundings, the Navy divers determined the bus probably landed on a shelf of rock 280 feet below the surface and about 150 yards from the spot where it went into the water. The ledge, however, ended abruptly a few yards farther out in the lake, dropping to depths over 1,400 feet. If the bus was not found on the ledge, the experts conceded there would be little chance of recovery. Only a diving bell used by the Navy for deep salvage operations could descend to such tremendous depths. Before descending on a potentially dangerous dive, McRae decided to sweep the suspect area with drag lines and grappling hooks. Late that afternoon, power launches commenced dragging operations, but they were suspended after only three sweeps because of darkness. The search for the bus resumed the following morning and continued throughout the day, but without success. On Thursday morning, November 29, 1945, McRae descended 262 feet into Lake Chelan. He stayed at that depth for nine minutes and covered a circle approximately 60 feet in diameter, searching for traces of the missing school bus. Upon his ascent, McRae was required to spend four hours in the portable decompression chamber to avoid the bends, nitrogen bubbles in the bloodstream that can cause excruciating pain, permanent injury, or even death. Meantime, dragging operations were resumed and continued throughout the day. The Forest Service towed a big electromagnet along the lake bottom, hoping it would attach to the vehicle's metal body. On Friday morning, November 30, 1945, the divers began searching at the 130- to 160-foot level, where two bodies had been found, but farther down the embankment. The dive team members, taking turns searching throughout the day, finally relocated the path of the lost school bus, late in the afternoon. The last diver into the lake was Lt. C. P. Ross, who stumbled across the bus's engine compartment hood while searching in near darkness. 
The search resumed in earnest on Saturday morning, December 1, 1945. Chief Petty Officer C. E. Myers followed the trail of debris and found the bus shortly after 10 a.m., resting on a ledge upside down, 275 feet from the shore at a depth of 210 feet. After returning to the surface, Myers was taken to the decompression chamber to recover from his dive. He reported seeing bodies, but visibility inside the bus was poor and he was unable to provide an accurate count. The next diver, Walter McRae, fastened cables around the front and rear axles. Then, winches carefully hoisted the wrecked bus alongside the barge so that the bodies could be removed. Divers found only five victims inside the bus, including the driver, Jack Randall. They continued searching the area around the wreck site for the nine missing children, but recovery efforts were eventually suspended when no additional bodies were found. The bodies were taken by launch to Chelan City Hall, where parents could positively identify their children. Fastened against the barge, the bus was towed to the Howe Sound Mining Company dock in Chelan, where it was removed from the water by a large crane. The Washington State Patrol, responsible for investigating traffic fatality on state roads, had the wreck hauled to a police garage so experts could determine if a mechanical failure caused the accident. On Wednesday, December 5, 1945, funeral services were held for the five victims recovered from the school bus on December 1st. The city of Chelan closed schools, offices, and stores, allowing everyone in the community to attend. Afterward, a memorial service was held on Lake Chelan at the site of the tragic accident for all of the victims. Small boats circled the area where the bus was found, dropping flowers into the water. On Thursday, December 20, 1945, the Washington State Patrol released the official results of their investigation into the fatal accident. Chief Herbert W. Algeo explained the accident was caused by a blinding snowstorm that obscured Jack Randall's vision, causing him to collide with a rock outcropping along the right side of the roadway and throwing the bus off its line of travel. Apparently, Randall didn't realize the road was bending to the right and drove diagonally across the road over the bank into the lake. Although no mechanical defects had been found which could have contributed to the mishap, Algeo vowed to intensify the State Patrol's semi-annual school bus inspections. Chief Algeo went on to say that it was incumbent upon school authorities to prevent buses from operating when weather conditions were unsafe. However, parents in the community pointed out that concrete guardrails which were supposed to have been built along the lake road would have prevented the tragedy. Ironically, on Thanksgiving Day, November 22, 1945, a front-page story in the Chelan Valley Mirror had quoted Chelan County Commissioner Leon Cronk as saying that the South Lake Shore Road would be improved and oiled in 1946. After the tragedy, children in the Lake Chelan School District began collecting money for a memorial to their dead classmates. Later, Chelan businesses took up the cause, adding additional funds. The Chelan community collected enough money to erect a monument and establish a small memorial park, which is located near the site of the accident on State Route 971, approximately one mile east of Lake Chelan State Park. Sudden death over time, we're dark.